Hello everyone and welcome back to What A Bob, a pollen podcast. I'm joined by my nearest and dearest Lucky Beans and Veg. How are you all doing? We're recording this a few days after the clips. We're in pollen ecstasy. How are you kids? Excited, but slightly mortified, right Veg? <laughs> It's not been my weekend. Take it from the top, babe. So Friday, I'm out for a run and I like trip over and fall on the ground and I get up. I'm like, all right, fine. I've got like scuffed hands. I can see my knees bleeding a bit, but I'm like, okay, I'll just get home, clean up. And then I get home and look at my knee and it's like the biggest... I don't know, trigger warning for gross. I won't go super gross, but it was like very deep and very graphic and very gross. Obs has seen the picture. It's so bad, honestly. I didn't, I could see the inside of her body deeply. I literally have no idea how that happened. So I ended up going to the, like the hospital, like the emergency room, A&E. And you fainted. And I was like there the whole afternoon and then I've now got stitches in my knee. And then, so that was Friday. <laughs> we think that that was the blood sacrifice for getting the clips. Yeah, genuinely. You're welcome, guys. We got the clips because I sacrificed. I had to pay for it. Blood was shed in Greenwich. <laughs> the gods have been appeased. How many stitches did you get? Seven. Seven. Lucky number seven. Mm-hmm. In slightly funnier news, <laughs> though. So I think we all knew the day would come when one of us got audibly recognized. <laughs> <laughs> audibly. And some of us have told some of our friends about the podcast, like, you know, we're I think we were all like Newsday would come but we were kind of like okay but I don't think I expected the person who found me and messaged me to be my boyfriend's ex-girlfriend thank you for listening <laughs> <laughs> oh no <gasps> how did she recognize you so I think she was watching like clips from season three I guess she watches Bridgerton and like one of our reels came up and it was us talking about Colin's <laughs> bed sheets oh, of no. all things. So <laughs> an extremely important topic, I must add. Oh. Anyway, I've left it on red. Sorry, babe. But we were together when this message came through because you've been helping me move all day. Yeah. I've been driving OBS around South London. God, it's a trek, you know? Yeah. And then Ob sent us a picture of Veg like <laughs> curled over like her yeah. steering wheel and mortification. God. <laughs> How's everyone else? Well, Veg we're neighbours again. Yeah. I was yeah. back in London, eyes on the ground once more. I told my other local friends it's over for you bitches. No ops is back. <laughs> she is back. I'm in my green dress, getting out of my carriage. People are reading my whistle downs. It's all going on. But how <laughs> are the Americans doing? I'm pretty good. I had therapy the other day, sobs. Didn't expect that to happen. Oh, God. And I'm reading a book, but it's um, Ghosts of the Tsunami by Richard Lloyd Perry. And it is one of the more harrowing books I have read ever. It's about the 2011 tsunami me in Japan. I have had to take extended breaks from reading this and I think it's really well done. I think he's an excellent author. It's just if you can't do sad books, don't read anything that he's ever written. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I've had about 11 hours of sleep in three days, but I feel very excited about <laughs> season three, <laughs> the content we're going to get soon. You really put a shift in this week. Um, I do hope one day I will sleep again. But in the meantime, the new pollen clips are keeping me alive and awake and elated. Yeah, I will say when I'm feeling particularly sad, I go and rewatch the Moonlight scene. I thought you were going to say like, I go and watch the drawing room scene and I was like oh that really sweet moment you know you when you're feeling sad you go and watch the sad scene well I watch both to be honest I watch both too but the moonlight scene it's like you can tell there's already something intense you can see Colin's mind is like he's just he's almost there and it's almost the moment and it's a great little I don't know why we're telling you anybody listening to this you know <laughs> But this episode, we're actually going to be doing a bit of a QA. and I mean, we've done a lot of questions and answers yeah. just on those two scenes. But before we actually get into the questions, Lucky, can you take us through the breaking crumbs of the week? Well, Lucky, what a big week we've got ahead of us. But, you know, before we go forwards, let's <laughs> go have backwards. a look. Take us through. <laughs> yeah, like, before we go forwards, let's go backwards. Okay. What on earth has been going on in the House of Commons this week? Well, hello, Barbkin. We sadly had to skip crumbs during our last few emergency episodes. So if you haven't been glued to social media, here is what you may have missed. Mm -hmm. For my fellow Americans, hope you enjoyed the Super Bowl. For pollen fans worldwide, as everyone probably knows by now, we will be having our own Super Bowl event on <laughs> Valentine's Day, as Netflix is hosting a special virtual event in honor of season three, followed by a Q&A from the cast. Many cast members are attending, so please sign up 
if you have not yet, we will share the link in our show notes. And I would just like to say in advance, <laughs> in the event that the Bridgerton gods are merciful and Nick and Newt speak about Pollen's letters, I may not survive the event, so we'll see how that goes. I don't know how we're going to survive it either, so <laughs> we will do our best. <laughs> but, uh, anyway. Oh my word. Well, what else is going on? Earlier this week, a big group of cast and crew gathered together for a private screening of season three. Mm. Listeners, I'm sure you've all seen the photo shared by Nicola and Tom Verica. Fans were particularly excited to see Nick and Newt's in a photo together, mm. but they were also joined by many new and returning cast members, including, very interestingly, all three Cowpers. Mm. Is this a suggestion that the Cowpers will be playing a significant role in season three? Hugh Sachs, who plays Brimsley, also confirmed that the screening was for the first two episodes of the season and said, quote, just seen the first two glorious episodes of Bridgerton 3 with this rebel. Mr. Luke Newton and Miss Nicola Coughlin are stupendous. You are in for a real treat and we truly cannot wait. Stupendous. And then James Foon shared a picture of the opening title cards. Yes. And I got very emotional at the idea of Colin's name being on the tree. Mm -hmm. That is something I've been looking forward to the entire time. Mm -hmm. We got super emotional thinking of the idea that Luke Newton has finally seen his character's name on the tree. Colin Mm -hmm. Bridgerton's name is on the tree. Ugh, we cannot wait to see it. He wasn't even in the opening credits of season two because he wasn't in tier one and now he's on the bloody tree. (laughs) Life comes at you fast. No, it doesn't. This has come at us so slowly. (laughs) Yeah, we're still moving backwards as we move forward. Oh, and a breaking crumb for the night we are recording these crumbs. Luke Thompson has just won the Best Supporting Actor Award at the What's On Stage Awards in London for his performance in A Little Life. So huge congratulations to Luke. Obs, you saw A Little Life, didn't you? Did, I did. It was very, very good. It was uh, it was intense, but mm-hmm. very well-deserved award. Moving on. In an interview with Hello Magazine, Nicola spoke a little bit about season three. She said she is so excited and honestly can't wait. The fans of Bridgerton are amazing. And she described the experience as one of the best she's ever had and hinted that she'll be going on a world tour for the show this year. You could say they're going on a grand tour. Yeah. Lads, lads, lads. Chaps, chaps, chaps. Chaps, 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 yeah. <laughs> in the recent clip we received, Penelope compliments and stares into Colin's eyes. If you're mm-hmm. anything like us, you were equally dazzled by Penelope's eyes in that clip. This is funny <laughs> considering in a recent article with Marie Claire Australia, Nicola said that one common misconception about her is that she wears contacts as her eyes are, quote, just freaky wolf blue. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. She also spoke about how she's trying to stop apologizing so much, which is something I personally relate to. And when asked what love means to her, she said, just feeling safe and like you can be true to yourself and not have to compromise or prove anything or do anything. I just feel like that is so true of Pollen's relationship as well. I just had to share that. If I had a heart, it would be moved. (laughs) Um, this piece of news absolutely delights me. If you have been mm. listening to our rewatches, you know that Ovs once famously played a blade of grass in The Lion King. Well, in an interview with Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Johnny Bailey shared that his first acting gig was a crying raindrop in Noah's Ark. <laughs> Amazing. Johnny Bailey also filmed a short skit where he joked about singing for 24 hours in an ad for Red Nose Day on March 15th. We will share the link in our show notes if you'd like to take a look. Mm-hmm. Bigger news for Johnny Bailey and Wicked fans. The first teaser trailer for Wicked aired during the Super Bowl. We got a teensy little glimpse of Johnny as Fiero. Can't wait to dance through life with you, Johnny Bailey. In other cast news, Golda's new animated film Orion in the Dark is streaming on Netflix. She plays an adorable character named Unexplained Noises. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Fulton's film Falling Into Place will premiere in the UK at the Glasgow Film Festival in March. And according to a story shared by Chris, there will be a Q&A if you're interested in attending. Mm-hmm. While in New York, Nicola shot more Bridgerton season three promo at a tea salon for CBS, and she looked absolutely gorgeous while doing it. So it'll be exciting to see that eventually. Speaking Speaking of Bridgerton season three promo, Nicola also did a shoot atop the Empire State Building, rising Mm -hmm. to new heights, it seems. And speaking of the Big Apple, both Nicola and her hair and makeup artist for that shoot heavily hinted that she'll soon be returning to New York, so we'll keep our eyes peeled for that. It is fashion week coming up, but Mm -hmm. can they get in between London and New York quick enough? Fashion week ends on Valentine's Day, so the window is closing. Oh, so no. (laughs) There goes my theory. (laughs) But in other fashion news, Johnny Bailey was featured in a promotional campaign for Olabar Brown's Spring and Summer 2024 collection. Ruth Gemmel, James Foon, Hannah Dodd, and Jessica Matson all attended the Vanity Fair BAFTA Rising Star Party and looked stunning while doing so. Mm-hmm. And our leading man, Luke Newton, rocked a gorgeous plaid jacket, also at the Burberry Takeover of Harrods. And finally, Simone Ashley was photographed by Edward Ennefel for his last cover of British Vogue with a sisterhood of 40 megastars. Now, the big piece of news everyone is talking about this week, apparently a member of the Bridgerton season three crew stated that some scenes in Bridgerton season three are so hot that they needed a cold shower, (laughs) followed by a mirror emoji, a carriage emoji, and a chair emoji, suggesting Pollen may have a steamy scene featuring a chair. Is this the piece of furniture that Nick and News broke? That remains to be seen. But some clever Pollen sleuths went back through some comments Nicola recently made about
about season three on social media where she wrote, quote, I shall be sat and quote, I'm seated <laughs> in response <laughs> to things like some of the new stills we received, possibly an allusion to the aforementioned chair scene. As always, thank you for your services to the fandom, Nicola. Well, you know, we did say in our What a Pirate episode, she had this chaise long story. Mm-hmm. By wet leg. It was always written in the stars. And of course, who can forget Romance Miss Bridgerton, second epilogue. Yeah. If you know, you know. <laughs> the only flat surface. The only flat surface. <laughs> On that note, and in more crummy news, Nicola celebrated Luke Newton's birthday by sharing a photograph of Luke and choreographer Jack Murphy on set. Eagle-eyed fans were able to spot the distinctive floor and decor of the Featherington entryway in the background, so thank you for that, Nicola. Sadly, Nicola is now in Netflix jail after letting slip details about James Foon's role in season three, which our lovely Uh-oh. fans will be delving into more. We had to give her an opportunity to weigh in on this piece of news, which has delighted all of us, honestly. A few of you have been asking how she's doing. She will tell you how she's doing. <laughs> Beans. Now the crowds need to know how are you doing? I was right. I was right. I was motherfucking right. I was right. I was right. I was motherfucking right. I was right. That's how I feel about it. And I'm really excited for it. It's actually happening. I know. We're getting so many love stories this season. Yes. It's a season of love. Season of love. Season of romance. It really is. I'm so excited because we're getting Prudink. Uh-huh. We're getting... Prawn. Prawn. We are. We're getting... We're not getting Mudlet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mudlet's rest in peace, Mudlet. But we're getting Marcus and Violet, so... Now that. Vicus? That is... The- Vicus? Vicus, Yeah. It's like an inversion of Viscountess as well. Yeah. <laughs> Getting bikers and pollen. And pollen. Season of love. So there are so many things, right, that we have assumed that could be wrong. Mm-hmm. But how thrilled mm-hmm. are you? I'm so excited. I was genuinely going to be, and I know this is, it's silly because the stakes are so low, but <laughs> I was going to be so upset <laughs> if Prudig didn't become a thing. I was going to be so upset because it's just like, they just fit. It just makes sense, you know. Match made in heaven. I mean, come on. The prud- prudent Stankworth. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, his name's Harry or Henry? Harry. Harry, that's right. It might be short for Henry. Harry short for Henry? Do you know, what in the no, British no, 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 no. nonsense no. is this? Do you know Prince Harry? Yeah. His name's Henry. He's called Prince Henry. There's the same amount of letters. I know. <laughs> I never said it was a good nickname. I just said it was a nickname. It's like a diminutive. If my name was Henry and I really needed a <laughs> fucking nickname, it'd either be Hen, Hen. or Re. <laughs> my name's Hen. It's short for Henry. <laughs> like, come on. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. No, because here, Harry is short for Harold. And that makes sense. Okay. Y'all are on some gumbo mumbo bullshit. <laughs> But Prudank, also, thank you, Nicola. Um, we hope you get out of Netflix jail soon. <laughs> you really took one for us there. It was my babe, the one and only, the leading lady herself mm-hmm. that revealed this information to us. Well, her comment was, love you, B-I-L, brother-in-law, confirmed. It could be babe-in-law. But what a glorious day. What a glorious day. Prue Dane. We're going to be married and everything. My gosh, I don't think we're going to get a wedding. Or if we do get a wedding, it's going to be like in a montage of stuff. We might get like the Philippa wedding, right? Where it was like two seconds. Yeah. But what a glorious two seconds. Right. We're going to get like three weddings this season. Okay, I won your predictions. Okay. Are they going to be straight love at first sight, episode one? Do you think Colin's going to match make? No. And be like, oh my God, Mm -mm. these are perfect for each other. Get them together. Do you think their eyes are just going to meet? I have a couple of theories. Again, I'm probably not right. Go for it. But I wasn't right about Prudink. Who knows? So the first one is, I think that they're just going to like naturally get along. Like Prudence is going to do something Mm -hmm. and everyone's going to scoff, but Dagworth is going to be like, oh my God, she's lovely. I love her. (laughs) Do you think they're both going to (gasps) sing? Everyone's been wanting Colin to sing, but... No, I want Prudink. A little Prudink duet. Because I was in the shower last night singing to myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, what would I want Prudence to sing? Do you know Tis the Last Rose of Summer? No, you can have to perform it now. Okay. It goes, Tis the last rose of summer left blooming all alone. I would be so funny if she sang that, because it's all about roses dying off and shit. It's <laughs> <laughs> like Colin and Penn are just like having a tense moment. <laughs> I will say there's this one melodic moment that I would fucking love to hear Prudence or Bessie take on. It goes, Mm -hmm. No flower of her kindred, no rosebud is nigh. (laughs) I would love to hear Bessie take that on. And do you think Dankworth will be 
a beautiful singer or do you think he will be perfectly matched with Prudence's talents? Oh my god, it would be so funny if he was a gorgeous singer but he just adored Prudence. I was like, she's just as good. What are you guys talking? Like he had a really beautiful voice and he just like loved Prudence so much that all he heard was like diamonds in his ears when she sang. Like, yeah, I would just... Fuck this pollen shit. I'm... Let's just bin the podcast. (laughs) We're now a Prudence podcast. I'm here for it, you know? I'm here for it. True fucking love. When do you think they're going to get married? I think it's probably going to be before the mid-season break. Basically, they're going to just have a natural connection, but Portia is not going to like that they're together. She's going to want to aim for something a little bit higher. So mm-hmm. I feel like she's going to push Deb like onto Prudence because my prediction is she's not really going to pay attention to Penn mm-hmm. until she realizes either that Debling is more interested in Penn mm-hmm. or that Colin's in love with Penn. I think it's been one of the two. Well, we have that interesting bit from the EW article mm-hmm. before Christmas where it's like the family going to be rocked yeah. by Penelope, you know, by what happens. Yep. So it might be that like she, she gets sick of being overlooked yeah. and then she does something quite dramatic or she forces that flip yeah. where she shakes up the family. Mm-hmm. But until that point, she keeps being overlooked. It's going to be like Portia's season of acceptance, right? Like uh-huh. I feel like she's going to have to come to terms with all of these things with pen and also that means coming to terms with someone who her daughter loves which again Mm -hmm, plays into like mm -hmm. the emma trope you know and you've got a character who hasn't believed in true love or at least hasn't believed that like that's the aim that she can afford for their family and yet in the end all three of her daughters are going to have found true love right because she wants her daughters to be in positions of like power within the town and she doesn't want them to have marriages like she's had in terms of always having to struggle right exactly and so Portia is the opposite of Violet Mm -hmm. which is why she's an important character Mm -hmm. the foil because she doesn't want her daughters to marry for love she wants them to marry so that they Mm -hmm. will be safe and well taken care of Mm -hmm. and that's just because she has had to live a life of insecurity with yeah. her husband. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think they're going to have chemistry instantly. They're going to fall in love. And we're going to see them, like, flirting in the background and stuff like that. Ah! And it's not the beauty of a Regency fairy tale that they can all have mm-hmm. happy endings. I know. It's going to be so cute. The season's going to be great. Oh, I love it. I love it. I've got so many weddings to get to, babe. Wouldn't it be so funny if all of that big rigmarole, like, the wedding and everything, was actually a <laughs> Prudent at the end of the series and not fallen. <laughs> that would be so funny. Well, not to spoil our block four episodes, which are coming at some point, but we did see Prudank at the wedding. We did. We mm-hmm. might share those. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's their wedding, but I thought it would be so funny. <laughs> what tipped us off with the polling wedding was that they, both Dankworth and Prudence, were clearly part of the wedding party. Yeah. And also there were a bunch of people who were saying that they were like standing together and stuff during filming. Yeah. But you know, babe, it's almost Valentine's Day. It's almost Valentine's Day. We will Day. talk again very soon yes you know the poop brigades are happening again i'm gonna be shitting and crying <laughs> <laughs> we've got a shift to put in Ayo. well thank you for joining us for uh, mm-hmm. this little tangent as we delved into a pre-dunk podcast yeah I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah and thank you yeah. again, Nicola. Yes, we honour you. We salute you. Let us know how much your bail is and we will call up together and get you out of Netflix jail. Yeah. Well, my beans, we'll go see past you in a little while. The past you that didn't know about Prudank. Yeah. And I will see you next on Valentine's Day. See you on Valentine's Day. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, lucky those were some good crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, delicious crumbs. Thank you. Okay, so we've decided this week to mix it up a little bit and do a bit of a Q&A. In our last Q&A, it was all listener sourced. But in every episode and every recording we've done, I've like been making little notes like as we've gone, questions that I keep meaning to ask you, little theories that keep popping up that maybe haven't naturally found a place within an episode. But I do want to ask you some of them. So if you don't mind, do we want to get started? Yeah, you... Just quickly, this actually was one of our listener questions, so there are a couple sprinkled in. But one of our lovely listeners asked, how did show Penelope start Whistle Down? And do you think we will see this in season three? Will it be similar to the books where she had help from her father solicitor? Or has she done this entirely mm. herself? What were her original intentions? Mm. Do you think we're going to see it? Do you think we're going to get that backstory for her? We may do, yeah. They love a backstory in Bridgerton, don't they? And it's strange. It's such a strange dynamic because mm-hmm. the other series have focused on well, actually, no, that's season one. We saw a lot more of Simon's backstory. Well, we got we got Simon's backstory. So we got the love interest backstory. And then season two was the main characters. So it, it could go either yeah. way. Yeah. I think they will because I feel like we need kind of an explanation mm. about how it started. Mm. And I don't know if it's going to be her, her solicitor. We know based off of what Nicola has said as well that she, st- she does it because she doesn't feel like she belongs within society. And I'm wondering yeah, yeah. if there has to maybe be 
be a middleman there to be like they have read her stuff and were like oh this is actually really funny or they quipped that she was really funny just in general which is what the solicitor did in the book yeah he, he like saw it and was like oh you should do something with this so maybe she'll have a solicitor but I don't, we haven't really been introduced to anybody with the past few seasons and I feel like we would have at this point so I don't know you know what could be touching is this would also make his character well-rounded but her dad if her dad was the one who oh. noticed because he's kind of a shitty father he's a gambling addict he's not interested in marrying off his daughters he's basically gambled away their fortunes yeah. but maybe before mm-hmm. the start of the season just when she was starting out Lady Whistledown he wasn't that bad and also maybe he just had these glimmers of moments where he connected with Penn because she was kind of like the outlier in their family yeah. he was kind of the outlier in their family he was always kind of removed and apart from them as well it could be sweet if there was like a moment where he mm-hmm. found her writing and encouraged her in some way maybe he saw something she'd written and then he he like made a comment and that's the only time one of the only time in the family she's felt validated or seen yeah yeah especially if he is a gambling addict and he knew about lady whistledown but didn't take her money i feel it could be really touching yeah. like knowing mm-hmm. that is something that he would be at risk to do and also it would be nice to see <laughs> you know some resolution to his uh, murder plot but it would also just be nice to make him a more three-dimensional yeah. character than kind of a bad dad who just gets offed in season one has anyone checked ben miller's spotlight i don't think he'll have a spotlight he's too famous <laughs> i just went on his imdb <laughs> you know what i kind of i know what you mean it'd be nice to see that but i wonder if i, I don't know is it more is it more powerful if this completely came from her yeah yeah, yeah, maybe. Because if we think about the timeline, she began writing before she'd entered society. So it isn't fully tied in with her being a wallflower who is dismissed at balls and things or like overlooked mm-hmm. in public because she hadn't been presented to society yet. So she might have been in society, but not officially. But if we think about her family dynamics, then is this the only way that she felt so overlooked in her family? Like she didn't fit in, like no one was listening to her, like she didn't know how to express herself, that this was all her intention with Whistledown was just to find a way to use her voice and to recognize her talent and to be heard in some way that she just couldn't get within her family and then more externally within society. Second theory, it could also be interesting if we know there are other scandal sheets at the time and in the first mm-hmm. episode of Bridgerton, I believe they even comment that, oh, this one has the names. That's what was different about it. So I wonder if maybe we have like a scene where like Portia, who is just like the gossip queen, is reading one of these scandal sheets and she makes some kind of like offhand comment like we don't even know who they're talking about. It would be more interesting if we at least had the names or something like like that. Yeah, like what good is gossip if it's blurred out? Yeah, and maybe that sparks an idea in Penelope, especially because Nicola has told us that she's drawn from Polly Walker's acting yeah. and from Portia to kind of form Penelope. And it'd be really interesting if Portia inspired her indirectly to become the scandal sheet writer. Yeah, and she could have done it as a way to seek her mom's approval without seeking it directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would also be interesting when Portia eventually finds out that Penelope is Lady Wilson yeah. down if she realizes. Yeah. It would just be an interesting way to carry through her relationship through the season. Being that such a truthful part of a relationship like that, because even if you have been overlooked or neglected emotionally in some capacity, I think there is still something within everyone who still wants your parents' approval and your parents' love. Yeah, I think we do need that backstory because some audience members don't find her sympathetic. And if yeah. we get backstory as to what motivated her, then that it rounds out that aspect of her character and makes her more sympathetic. Yeah. Just a very quick follow-up question. Do you think Penelope ever expected it to be as successful as it ends up being? No. Do you think she has that innate confidence in her work or did it even surprise surprise her. I think it surprised her. And then does that impact the way that she messily sometimes deals with situation because yeah. she didn't expect it to be as big as it was. She mm-hmm. didn't expect it to be that big. She didn't expect to have this power come to her and it starts to get into her head in season two. So yeah. A bit of a more lighthearted question, another quick question. What would Eloise have done had she found out that Penelope was in love with Colin? So I'm talking about Eloise before 208, before she finds out about Whistledown or anything like that. Let's say she found out in the first or second season, what would she have done? Lots of eye rolling. Yeah, Lots of eye rolling. I think she wouldn't have taken it seriously. It's kind Mm. of like whenever you find out that someone has a crush on your sibling, you're just like, oh, ew. (laughs) Yeah. Don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't think she would have taken it very seriously. I'm going to be honest. Do you think she would have tried to intervene and push them together? Or would she be like, absolutely no way are you getting with my friend? I was going to say, I think she would be more of a cock block. I should be like, okay, this is my friend. I'm just going to like when if she ever caught them in like a little moment, she'd be more quick to intervene and kind of drag her friend out of the situation and back to into her zone focused on her maybe mm. because i feel like there would be a jealousy there as well because it's like this is my friend you're taking my friend yeah. you 
you know? Because I feel like part of the reason Eloise harps on Colin a lot is because Colin has that freedom to travel where she doesn't. So her not wanting to listen to him, I think partially is like out of jealousy because she doesn't have those same freedoms. She doesn't have, she as a single woman in that time period yeah. cannot just travel as she wishes. And so I think part of that comes from a type of jealousy. And I think that would be more mm -hmm. played up mm -hmm. with, oh, my friend's in love with you. Yeah. You can't have all this freedom as well as taking my friend from me. Well, a bit of a double-sided question here. So obviously by this time, Penelope is not doing too great. First of all, do you think Penelope will continue to try and make amends with Eloise throughout the season whenever she can? Do you think she'll keep reaching out? Even maybe she doesn't keep reaching out, do you think she's going to retain that hope for a reconciliation? Or is she going to believe that their friendship is irretrievable, it's gone, it's burned down to the ground? And if she does believe the latter, then how does she envision this impacting her relationship with Colin? For example, would she be engaged to him if Elle was still refusing to speak to her? How would Penelope configure fitting into the Bridgerton life if she feels like there is an irretrievable breakdown in a relationship? I think it would give her pause in thinking about her as a character. I think it would, like her relationship with Eloise was very important mm -hmm. to her mm -hmm. and she's not going to have forgotten about that. And so I think it definitely will play a part. I also think from the perspective of Bridgerton as a show, I think they will want to tie up, set, well, it depends where the engagement comes, but yeah. if we are focusing on making sure that Colin shows her that he probably loves her then mm -hmm. I feel like in that sort of same vein they may want to tie up like the Eloise loose ends it will just help the audience sort of fully come to terms with it maybe not by the engagement but by wedding yes yeah do we think that if they're holding out the Penelope's reconciliation as long as they can which Nick has suggested that it's going to take a long time yeah yeah if they're engaged before that point is that going to be like one of the final blocks that Penelope's going to have to mentally come to terms with or do you think Colin is just going to steamroll her and be like she'll be fine she'll be your sister you're just going to have to figure it out maybe they'll reconcile like at the wedding and I also don't think that would be very like Colin mm. to be like oh it'll just be fine yeah that's more of an Antony do you think he'll try and fix it then because he's like I'll try and make this better between you. I think that Elle will approach him mm -hmm. when she learns of his engagement because of the Lady Whistledown situation. And I think she's going to be shocked that he knows yes. and that Penn told him and that yeah. he is okay with it and still wants to marry her. And I think that will be the first step towards Elle starting mm -hmm. to turn back towards their friendship. I don't think she will come back to Penn. It will just be like that first step toward the reconciliation, realizing that someone else knows that Penn is Lady Whistledown and isn't that upset about it. And that he loves her. But I do think that Penelope would, at the start of the season have no hope of a reconciliation especially after that scene mm -hmm. where we saw that Penelope still at the Moody's shop mm -hmm. where they're yeah I think that Elle is going to be very cutting and she's going to be like that's a nail in the coffin yeah I think that yeah that's the the death of that dream for her I don't think she will have any hopes of a reconciliation and it will just be something that happens as the story unfolds later in the season I kind of hope that Colin isn't the catalyst for them becoming friends again no I think it'll be Cressida like you suggested oh. but I do like the idea that she's like oh yeah you can yeah. still love someone if you don't love everything that they've yeah. done or you don't agree with everything that they've done. I just think that there's no way that Eloise is not going to approach Colin after an engagement to see if he knows about Lady Whistledown, mm. especially if she has a negative opinion of Lady Whistledown at that time, and especially right. if the Queen is hunting Lady Whistledown. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a shock to her to know that Colin still wants Penelope even under all those circumstances. It'll be a shock, but we also know that Eloise is very much like she can hold a grudge. So mm -hmm. I feel like she would also then be mad with Colin like she would be like well you don't know what you're getting into and all this other stuff and yeah continues to be so like stubborn and headstrong <laughs> it's funny that she doesn't get along mm. with Antony as much because she is very much like Antony that's really true I think they are the, very similar in that way but it's to tie back to what we were saying in that early question that joking question about you know what would Eloise have done had she figured it out beforehand when you're mm. saying that she holds a grudge and she holds on to that pain a lot of that pain is rooted in the very sad reality that she lost her best friend in the process of everything and it's that almost losing her again to yeah. Colin and mm -hmm. seeing her continue her life without her that might because for Eloise like you were saying that she expresses that pain through holding on to it in this way she's not going to try yeah. and hurt Pen and like yeah. throw her under the bus or anything but it, she carries it with her yeah just a last question on Colin, Eloise and Penelope before we move on to a different topic. We've talked a lot before about if Colin suspects that Eloise is whistled down, right? Mm -hmm. So if this is true and this is the direction they're going, if Colin yeah. has suspected that Eloise is whistled down, then has he already come to terms with the fact that someone close to him was responsible for the Marina situation and has that helped him move on from the situation? Yeah, I think so. You know, if he's like, it was Elle and maybe Penelope knew, then he's had mm -hmm. all that time to process that and let go of yeah. any anger or confusion or resentment so it's not going to fall out, which Jess has recently said 
said in that Christmas interview. And will that get expressed in the show? Possibly. I think this is one of our listeners. I had a conversation with her about this, but I also think it could be really clever if they play with audience expectations about what Colin suspects and who he suspects is Lady Whistledown. So it could be interesting if like something happens at a ball where the, you know, the bounty for Lady Whistledown is mentioned and we see Colin eyeing Eloise or something. Maybe there's some drama. Or maybe he catches a glimpse between Ellen Penn and he misinterprets yeah. the meaning of the glance. Mm. Yes. And we, the audience, think, oh, he thinks that Elle is Lady Whistledown. Mm -hmm. By then and by that point in the story, maybe he's also spent so much time with Penelope that he's starting to catch on that there's more to her as well. But maybe he maybe. hasn't quite made the connection yet that she's Lady Whistledown. It would be a good rom-com vibe. That kind of like misunderstanding yeah. Yeah. does play into some rom-com tropes. And we know that mm -hmm. that will be part of the series. So I could just yeah. definitely see that happening. And I think we have precedent for this in 205 The Duck scene where he's like, oh, you're lying about where Eloise is. Like, you don't know where she is. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then secondly, in 207, when he loses the fact that... No, there are no secrets between you two. That, yeah. Yeah. And then maybe if he does suspect that Eloise's Lady Whistledown, he might think that that's responsible for the rift. So completely getting mm. on the right track, but just the inversion of it. Or you, yeah. as you say, it could be a big fake out and he could know exactly who it is. Okay, bit of a, another question for you. Do the other siblings know that Colin and Penn have a friendship or forget their relationship do you think their friendship is going to be a surprise to everyone I mean, we're going to have to have a moment where Colin's like guys we've literally always been friends no. you've just never seen it or is the show going to retrospectively be like everyone kind of knew that they were friends mm. so that isn't the big deal what do you think well we know everybody knows that we're friends I don't think we did they're always by themselves no because Anthony has said that he's danced with Penn any number of times and Ben and everybody mm. has been in the room with them as well I think the family knows that they're friends because she also talks to Colin when she's at the house as well. Like, they're often talking together at balls. We see that happen a lot. Mm -hmm. She goes over to their house quite regularly and the family witnesses her talking to Colin. And Colin's always dancing with her at balls as well. Like, I don't think he would do that if he wasn't a friend with her because they're not suggesting that mm -hmm. Violet makes him do it like he, that she does in the books. He just does it because he's friends with her. And Anthony says that himself. So I think, yeah, the family is pretty well aware that they're friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if they've been friends through childhood. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think that there's any doubt about that at all. And I never got the impression that the family was unaware that they were friends. I got the impression that because they were friends, they let them get yeah. away with a lot of things, like being alone together, dancing together a lot. Yeah. I think romantically they dismiss it. I, I think they know that they have a friendship. Okay, well, to develop that a little bit further then, so we have the established friendship between them and everything like that. Do you think it's going to come up that Penn and Colin might not be able to be friends after marriage yes or that their friendship is going to change do you think that Colin has thought this far ahead and been like no once <laughs> <laughs> and might that come from someone like Anthony who needs to ground him and be like you do realize that when she's married, you can't keep doing this. And is that going to impact? Or Benedict, yeah. Yeah, because if it comes from Benedict, it's going to be more sincere and honest and be like, I need you to realize yeah. this now that mm. you won't have her. You can't have this friendship when she's married to someone mm -hmm. else. From Anthony, it would be a lot yeah. harsher. It would be like, what do you think you're doing? This isn't, yeah. this, this looks terrible. This isn't correct. But mm -hmm. do you think this is going to come up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I just say that as like, Benedict's supposed to be playing a bigger mm -hmm. role, not really necessarily their personality structure. <laughs> but I wonder too, though if yeah. like Ben's gonna be a little bit more harsh about it than Anthony because I feel like Anthony's definitely gonna soften up yeah. after marriage True. 100% maybe Benedict is still reeling from the frustrations within his own life mm. that way that perspective will come through and be like yeah. wake up though, a little bit of a harsher side mm -hmm. I would love for Anthony to take on a more like happy aloof role yeah. in the background you know because he's not so like angry anymore and he's like figuring himself out <laughs> like surprisingly way more more laid back <laughs> than season two because he's so you know buttoned up and uptight so if we just kind of see him lazing about and be like oh whatever i'm sure they'll figure it out he's like do whatever <laughs> And also, like, I feel like he will be more, like, unfortunate as it is to say. Like, Colin's a man. I feel like he's going to be less harsh about Colin yeah. hanging out with Penelope than... And we can't discount Kate's presence. Yeah, a huge change. Yeah, she has changed Anthony. And I think we maybe think of it of like, oh, she'll mellow him a bit. But I think it could be yeah. even more, like, intense, the impact she kind of has on his actions. And she can share that burden of it. Yeah. I do think the Anthony-Colin dynamic, though, is going to shift over the course of the season because mm -hmm. even in the Rangers house leaks we see him kind of poking fun at his outfit. That isn't to say I think that Anthony's going to get a full personality mm. change. No, 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 no. He's going to be the new Ben. But just who's playing what role within the story? Yeah, I feel like people assume that's what I mean. I just mean that like he'll probably still because like you 
said like he's poking fun of him for not being dressed correctly mm-hmm. yeah is what we're assuming so there will still be the sort of like the uptight mm-hmm. sort of virgo presence of antony but he'll just be like more laid back and a little bit more able to joke and things yeah. because he's in a partnership now so he's with someone who can share the duty the duty with him and like he has someone to talk yeah. through things with on a more intimate level than he necessarily had with his mother or somebody else yeah 100 percent. and he doesn't have to worry about sacrificing his own happiness for the sake of everyone else. And Kate, she brings in an outside perspective. She may realize that yeah. Antony needs exactly. to start viewing Colin as a brother and not like a son and start to yeah. respect him and let him make his own choices and his own mistakes and then support him when he right. makes his decisions. Because in season one, he wasn't really supportive mm-hmm. when Colin decided he wanted to marry. So I feel like in this season, he needs to be more supportive yeah. of Colin's choices and his decisions. So like, just a quick question, then we'll move on to something that ties in quite well. So if you do think that this concept of you can't be friends after you're married does come up, do you think that is going to be something that is more in the background as like a bittersweet, you know, talked about like Barclay Square being a bittersweet moment, the transition from childhood to adulthood and losing something and accepting things are going to change? Or do you think it will be a realisation that will motivate him to pursue her even more? Yeah, maybe. Add to the chaos. More chaos. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's just going to add to the drama. I think this is going to be like a moment that maybe happens in episode three or four where he starts to realise he's... he's losing pen that she may marry somebody else for real and that becomes a real prospect for him and this yeah and he realizes that he will no longer even be able to be her friend and by that point he probably wants more than that so it's just adding this layer of emotional turmoil losing her even more yeah and then just to tie into what we were saying then about, you know, in season when we had such a different approach to when Colin came and was like, I'm going to get married, yay. And the thing is, Colin is still very, very young in this yeah. season. He's only 21 moving into 22. Mm-hmm. Do you think that his family are going to think he's too young to marry? Do you think they're going to be like, this is happening very young? Or do you think they're just going to completely accept it because they know it's the right person? Yeah. And the issue was his potentially his immaturity in season one, but it was also people like Violet fundamentally knew there was something not quite right in that equation. Yeah. And do you think they're just going to embrace it? I will say from a personal standpoint, <laughs> <laughs> 22 is so young. I was so batshit crazy at 22. And I'm just sitting there like, imagine being married. I mean, Penn's going to be 19. <gasps> I just choose to ignore that ages. <laughs> I think that the family is going to be accepting of them because they're going to realize yeah. that it's love. Even though everything, we've even had shows uh, in America. Do you remember that show on MTV called um, Too Young to be Married or something like that? <laughs> if we do get the parallel of pollen between environment, which you guys don't like me using, <laughs> but I'll keep using environment to the dead eye. If they married young as well, then that's, that's like the point. foundational mm-hmm. pillar of the whole family. And then also the fact that if they recognize yeah. within him, him. It's different. Not even within like Penelope being with him, but like if they recognize within him that this is true love, like of course they believe in even someone like Anthony who who tried so hard to run from it has succumbed to true love. Yeah. That they'll be like, we know this is real. Wait, what was my Violet and Edmund? I went for Vilemond. Yours was Mudlet? Mudlet. <laughs> yeah, <horrifying>. Mudlet! <laughs> Mudlet. The jury's still out. Listeners, which do you prefer? Please let us know. <laughs> No, because that's in block four. They don't know about Mudlet yet. (laughs) Yeah, good point. Mudlet is coming your way to an episode in the future. I just feel like this season is going to be the opposite of the Pollen storyline in season one in so many ways. So I think the family needs to be supportive. They need to see it. They don't necessarily have to be happy about marrying into the Featheringtons again. But I think they'll see (laughs) that, that this is meant to be. Okay, we've had some pretty heavy questions there, so I'm going to do a couple of quick fire rounds, if that's all right with you kids. So just quick questions, quick answers. First of all, in season three, after Pollen, obviously, whose story are you most looking forward to seeing play out? Which subplot, which interactions? Who are you keeping your eyes out for? Mm. Well, now that I've seen more from it, I'm actually really excited to see a little bit of prawn. <laughs> <laughs> prawn. Prawn all the way. Prawn. My shrimp ladies, you <laughs> reunite. <laughs> Prawn, let's get together. Prawn truthers, rise up, gather your fishnets. It seems like, I don't know, all the Bridgerton dramas are always so dramatic. And I wonder yeah. if it will be easier and like calmer and nice for Fran's first love. And what's that yeah. going to be like in the context of Bridgerton and Shondaland? I think it's going to be super sweet mm-hmm. so that they break our hearts. So mm-hmm. I think I'm going to really become invested in the Fran relationship. Yeah. And it plays that dual role that we've talked about where it sets her up for the absolute 
breaking yeah. of like yeah. this fairy tale romance that ends in the most tragic way that you possibly can. Yeah. But also within season three, it plays that dual role of, you know, the opposite of Fran having this idyllic relationship mm-hmm. whilst Colin is. Yeah. Floundering. Yeah, floundering. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's a role on the front train. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry to Violet. Uh, excuse me. Beans. Beans, beans, beans. What the fuck are you doing, babe? Have a look <gasps> in the mirror. Prudick. That's the true. The Prudank wedding. Oh! I'm so excited to see James Foon. I bet he's mm. going to kill it. Well, here's the thing, though. I'm so excited, so excited. But I've talked about Prudink, so everybody knows yeah. I'm excited to see them. I feel like this was more like what is unexpected yeah. that you're excited to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I was just going to say, like, you know, I've talked about I'm excited to see the relationship develop between Penn and her mother. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, that would be a good arc. I've mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. I've mentioned Prudink. I wanted to talk about maybe something that's like <laughs> less Featherington focus. Because I was so excited to see the Feather obviously but like i'm excited to see fran and michael and you know what to get like another sibling love story in the same season mm-hmm. it's like very unique yeah yeah like we get to the price of one you know this season is gonna be packed to the brim with things going on i think so too and i love it i hate to say it but i feel like we're probably gonna get like one of those hour and a half <laughs> season finales yeah <laughs> honestly bring it on bring it on happy with that bring it on fran just in general, in romance, we're talking, which romance trope are you most likely to fall into? If you were a romance trope, what would you go for? Um, well, my husband and I were friends to lovers. Oh, <laughs> that is so beautiful. Is that one of the reasons you like pollen? I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, like, I read other tropes. I'm not like just like committed to the friends and lovers thing, <laughs> but there's I think there's just something about yeah. Penn and Colin's relationship that speaks to me beyond any tropes and how it's acted mm-hmm. and how their storyline's been told. But yeah, I like a I like a good friends to lovers. Vegetable, what are you? Ah, oh, so there was this guy at uni that I completely thought that we were enemies to lovers, and mm. he thought I was a bitch. <laughs> he thought I was just like bullying him, and I was like, oh, sorry, I thought it was banter. <laughs> so I don't think I can be that one. Do you know what? Again, I don't think this is me because I don't have. A adventures but I've always had a soft spot for like adventure where the characters mm-hmm. get into some kind of situation like a quest like a romance yeah. in the stone plot where like there's some kind of drama and then they like fall in love over the course of that yeah it's always a good yeah. one mm-hmm. so we'll mm-hmm. go with that even though I am unlikely to go on any adventures and I'm already with someone beans my little romantic fish what about you i don't know it, it just has to feel right like if i'm yeah. watching a television show Same. and it's like I, I don't like the vibes then i probably won't like it so it doesn't really matter what about a second chance romance i'm always here for tuba boy oh, yeah. no i no i don't like the sadness of second chance romance <laughs> oh no i will not be getting together with tuba boys well i will say my favorite jane austen book is persuasion so Jane Eyre is also my favorite and it's not exactly a second chance romance but it kind of is because Aww. you know she goes back and he's blind and they're like let's work it out <laughs> the only way it's gonna work for me is forced proximity oh there's only one bed <laughs> you in, the, in the old cabin <laughs> No, I'd be like, you're sleeping on the floor. I do love Friends to Lovers, but I also kind of hate it because I feel like it really enforces that women can't and men can't be friends Mm -hmm. in general. Like there has to be some romantic context to it. So while I love it, I also hate it because I feel like the connotation can be a little bit negative sometimes as well. I wouldn't want to be in it because it's so easy to, as we've seen through many episodes, it's so easy to misjudge where you both are in the journey Mm. or it's it's so easy to get caught up in something and then you risk is damaging right. a relationship that still really matters to you. Mm-hmm. I do think it's important to be friends with the person that you eventually are with, your partner. But I also, the that type of friendship is different in a romance mm-hmm. because when you eventually are married, there's so much other things. Or if, you know, you don't have to get married, you can be in a long-term partnership as well. There's so many things <laughs> that you have to, like, think about. As, this is getting too deep. I'm always advice for things. You always give the best advice. <laughs> this is one of the quick questions, sorry. <laughs> Beans, this ties into what you were talking earlier about Strictly Ballroom. Are there any yeah. movies or scenes from movies or TV shows or anything that you want to be incorporated or that you're keeping an eye out or that you've watched recently and you're like, oh my God, that is pollen? Well, like I said, Strictly Ballroom, it is my favorite. And they don't even really start as enemies to lovers mm-hmm. either. I don't know how I would describe them, but I like love their relationship because it's like they didn't start as friends. They didn't start as enemies. It was just like, she was like, I want to learn how to do this and I want to support you. Like practical. Yeah. 
Yeah. And they just like started bonding over that like shared experience. Maybe that's the type of romance I like shared experience. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm a quality time type girl myself. So yeah, I would say that a hundred percent strictly ballroom, but I'm biased cause I love it. I'm trying to think of my other ro- favorite romance movies. I need to do like a, a rom-com binge to like, mm. really get into the mindset mm. of what we're going to get. I mean, there's Ever After. Love that movie. Uh huh. I mean, Ever After is another one of my favorites, but yeah, but I don't think that's really pollen coded in my opinion. The other day when we were getting these clips and we were, just, and we were looking at how undone they looked and everything like that, mm. especially in the Moonlight clip, mm. I think we all were talking about Emma. Yeah. But I think ages ago you were talking about way back into Dumb actually you were talking about window pen and you said what was really strikingly reminiscent for you in that still was it reminded you of Emma yeah. mm-hmm. she was in the window after the ball in that very beautiful quiet contemplative moment oh I love Emma what we were saying the other day is the way that Colin looks and done you know in the moonlight still but also a little bit more in the unicolin was very reminiscent to us of nightly and I think we said this before we definitely won that moment yeah like something has happened, something has shifted and they're reeling from it. Especially with a character who's costuming and styling, who's been very yeah. like careful, considered, uh, restrained. Luke Newton said before, he's always very buttoned up. That yeah. that experience of his emotions is going to come out physically from how he looks his shovel. Yeah. But Lecky, we went on a spiral a while ago, didn't we, about Emma? Yeah. But not this Emma. Yeah, well, we started off talking about Pride and Prejudice. And at the end, we were talking about what Colin might call Penelope. And that brought to yes. mind Emma to me, where in the proposal from the 1996 one, it's, it's amazing. He says, marry me, my wonderful darling friend. And I was thinking it would really be sweet if they had a moment like that. But then at the end, he he says something like my wonderful darling wife but just to bring back the proposal from the 1996 one it's so good please go watch it but there's some lines of dialogue that maybe it is our imperfections which make us so perfect for one another and then Mr. Knightley says but what of my flaws and there's kind of just like this misunderstanding between them where Mm -hmm. Emma she's scared of listening to what he has to say because she doesn't know that he loves her and I feel like Penelope Mm -hmm. will not know that Colin loves her so there's this opportunity for this kind of misunderstanding where there might be a moment where she decides to hear him out even though she's scared and realizes he doesn't love her, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's not going to be exactly like Emma. But where she gives him the space to say his feelings, even though yeah. she knows it, it might hurt, that he doesn't love her, that she thinks he just wants to marry her out of honor and that she might have to reject him again or something like that. And then the, the surprise when she realizes that he does love her. Yeah. It's a great little moment. Also, it's mm-hmm. kind of giving Mansfield Park 1998, I think is when it came out. Mm-hmm. Because there is, I mean, I know they're cousins, but they're also friends. Cousins to love us. Just got to ignore that kind of thing in those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it works a Porsche. No more cousins. Cousins to love us. <laughs> but you know there is like a parallel there where a suitor comes in and they're trying to like seduce what's her face from Mansfield Park and then oh, that could be doubling but also there's like a they're all into like theater as well do you remember that like they're all into like acting out these little plays and if we're doing like a little music scene that mm-hmm. was in Romancing Mr. Bridgerton that's very like Mansfield Park-esque musical yeah so there, there are quite a few like I think Jane Austen parallels in all seasons Pride and Pride heavily in season two yeah I can't wait to see what she does for Colin specifically to like refer back to because I feel like mm-hmm. every season there's been some sort of homage yeah. to a particularly mm-hmm. famous romance yeah. scene you know Anthony was getting out of the water let's have Colin walking through some fog <gasps> mm-hmm. that'd be great Colin walking in fog everything thank you very much please do reshoot if that's not possible was it 1996 or 1995 that Emma what, what year did that come out 1996 1996 didn't they do archery there is archery hmm Yes. <laughs> what if that's Colin's thing instead of like Ooh. rowing a boat, he's shooting some arrows? Oh yeah, instead of boxing. Because <gasps> that ties into the Odyssey perfectly, proving his love through yeah. archery. Hmm. I could be into that. Talking of Colin's love, what episode do you think he's going to tell her that he loves her? <laughs> episode eight. Uh, Don't you fucking, fucking dare. I'll fight you, Beans. <laughs> five. <laughs> I will fight you, Beans. <laughs> I think five. The thing is with him is once he knows he's gone, you know? I think he declares his love in five. That's when they become engaged. Mm -hmm. Five or six. Yeah. I think six is the mirror scene. So I think he confesses his love before that. Not in the mirror scene. Fucking better. Well, if he's confessing his love during the mirror. (laughs) We need to feel it properly. Yeah. Especially if it's going to be them against something else. We need to establish them two first. I'm not having a repeat of season one. No offense to (laughs) Safni, but getting married and then not even happy about it. No, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> oh god no 
what will Eloise's reaction to Penn's plan be? And how will she re- react about seeing Hemi Is she just going to be very dismissive? Is she just not going to engage? Well, she's not going to know. Yeah, I hope she doesn't know. No, but if she's seeing her failing in public and things oh. like that. Oh. If she learns that Penelope is clearly trying to attract someone. I think Eloise is going to be become a bit of a mean girl. Or do you think she's just going to disengage? Mm. I think she's going to disengage. I think she's going to be wrapped up in her own thing, I'm going to oh, be yeah. honest. Yeah. Like, if she's becoming friends with Cressida, I mean, like, Eloise might go for a little bit of a mean girl route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Potentially. You know what we might see? Like, her making a quip about Penn Mm -hmm. to Cressida and Cressida's like group of people but you can tell that Eloise feels kind of bad that she said that yeah I can see that happening Speaking of Cressida, it's been a conversation that we've been having with one of our good friends, and I think I've seen it a couple of other places too. Mm-hmm, on the sub. That if we are going down the theory that Cressida is going to blackmail Penelope, I mean, like we were joking about in our last episode, like we don't know what does she want really. Yeah. Like in the books, it's very mm. clear motivated. Well, it's motivated by the fact that she's never liked her for a start, so it's a good way to make someone suffer, but mm. it's very motivated by money. Yeah. She wants money. Yeah. What is Cressida going to want from Penelope in the season? if this is the route they go down. I mean, she could want a Bridgerton. I don't think that's out of the question because she's... Or just be put in a good word. Well, I think she's always been interested in Colin from episode one Mm -hmm. of the series. Mm -hmm. We know she's kind of been interested in Colin. When I won... 208. Yeah, in the end of season two, we kind of see that that spark again, that, oh, maybe I can catch yeah. Colin. And so one of our friends was speculating that Cressida might not blackmail Penn for money, but maybe for Colin, you know, that she wants oh, Colin, which would be... Oh, that would be too oh much. Oh my God, the drama. I, I do have to say, like, I think Cressida's family has money it's been pointed out mm-hmm. like i mean i don't think that cousin jack has ripped off their family you know like entirely mm-hmm. isn't like yeah. squandered their entire fortune just because of that ruby scheme but they have money because cousin jack wanted to marry into that family he wanted to marry cressida for yeah. her dowry in the books she was a widow and that's where she kind of lost all the money from and everything like that yeah mm-hmm. and i think that also could tie into why cressida might want colin because it's the prestige of being a, a bridgerton and in addition to yeah. finally finding a husband after her, her failed attempts in two seasons and i also feel Mm -hmm. like there might be a like a tense moment between cressida and pen perhaps after the engagement is announced where like cressida says kind of some snide comment to Mm pen about her relationship with colin and penelope finally stands up for herself and cops back and says something to cressida that's kind of cutting and very lady whistle down which might be how cressida makes the connection later if she uses that phrasing later and i think that that will amplify the tension and, and kind of compel cressida to maybe make a move like this yeah so my theory was that crested is probably going to find out that penelope is lady whistled out because of something lady whistled out writes yeah yeah exactly yeah and that maybe she's reused the insult yeah like she wrote the insult and then pen uses it later that's what i was going to say to add on to the the cowpers aren't like seen well in society it could also be that cressida wants to blackmail Penn in order to get her to elevate her family's social standing because Penn doesn't really hold back when she's talking about the Cowpers, which is part of the reason, you know, it's, they also have made their bed as well with their reputation within the Tons. Mm -hmm. I think that people were talking about them beforehand, but Lady Whistledown has not helped with that because Penn has written scathing things about Mm -hmm. Cressida before. And so I think that that could be one of the reasons. And then maybe as a way to elevate that, she uses Colin and it's collateral. I mean, that's so interesting because, and, and this is this ties into the Queen issue as well, right? Is what you just said made me think that maybe she's like, I want to puppeteer what you write. Yeah. Yes. And from now on, you're going to say what I want. It's like, you know, the kid, like you're going to do my yes. homework for me and you're going to manipulate things. And then what you have is the conflict of Penelope's like, you're not controlling my pen, which then ties into right. her conflict possibly with the Queen where the Queen maybe wants to control pen and she's like, no one is yeah. controlling what I write. Right. Which is why she ultimately decides to go to the Queen. It could be both. I don't have the impression that anybody in the town wants Lady Whistledown to actually be figured out. I think that the reason why Cressida would say she's Lady Whistledown would be to give her a better social standing yeah. because so it's many like people point. rely mm-hmm. on her. Mm-hmm. So I think that if Whistledown or Penn, I mean, exposes Cressida, Cressida doesn't want to take away Lady Whistledown because Lady Whistledown has such an authority yeah. within the town. Yeah. Use her power 
to make her better. I really like this idea, but I wonder mm-hmm. if it might be both just because of the urgency that that would create and yeah. the the drama mm-hmm. of someone on the the subreddit pointed out that it would be Penn and Colin working together to be together, to remain together yes. and kind of yeah. like working in the yeah. in the shadows to kind of subvert Cressida's plan because they they want mm-hmm. to be together and they're committed to each other at that point. So that would be interesting. And yeah. then also tying into your theory, then Colin is also fighting for Penn to stay Lady Whistledown and to be true to herself and to, to yeah. her own words. Even knowing that she's Lady Whistledown, right. she's being hunted by the queen, that people are blackmailing her, that she could maybe lessen the attention and make herself less of a target if she just gives in, but instead decides yeah. to support her despite the risks. That could be also really great. I mean, especially if his entire confidence lessons has been, you are yourself, yeah. everything yeah. you need to be, but you just need to be stronger and more confident. Mm-hmm. Beans, what you were just saying about, it was such a good point that no one actually wants to figure out who Lady Whistledown is and the person who really doesn't want to figure out but thinks she does is the Queen I think she gets very caught up in the game of it all but I think really I mean the thrill is in the chase never in the capture and if we do I mean what's hilarious about this I will say is that we have no confirmation at all that there's going to be a blackmail plot with no confirmation of the (laughs) bounty but let's run with it okay (laughs) let's run with it Cressa does evolve yes so so the Queen doesn't actually if she thinks about it want to figure it out or end it I suppose she doesn't want to end it because it's power it's fun it's intrigue it's distraction for the Queen from the rest of her life then if she does set a bounty or a hunt or something like that, then what's going to trigger that? Is Penn going to write something particularly scathing that is going to push the queen over the line? Or is it just going to come from a place yeah. of boredom again? Probably boredom. Yeah, and we also discussed this in our Block 3 Crumbs episode. We speculated mm-hmm. that maybe the queen is, after Cressida announces that she's Lady Whistledown or something like that, the queen is just so frustrated and just wants an answer. Wants it done. And she's not thinking about the consequences of that, that it looks like she wants to mm-hmm. silence Lady Whistledown. And maybe even that moment she thinks she wants to silence Lady Whistledown and kind of give her a taste of her own medicine. But I feel like by the end of the season, she'll realize that she wants Lady Whistledown to be herself. And I feel like that final confrontation between Penelope and the Queen, it will be a realization for the Queen that she wants Lady Whistledown to be her own entity that's not influenced. Because we're recording these episodes out of order, but we have already recorded our block four. So in that, we talked a lot about episode seven and eight predictions. And to not spoil that too much, but I think what we were all intrigued by, maybe, you know, we had slightly different perspectives on it but an idea that we're particularly intrigued by is that Penelope under the weight of the blackmail under the weight of the bounty and the manipulation that comes with that and the risk to her voice will possibly choose to just hand, not hand herself into the queen because I don't think that's the right phrasing but will choose to go to the queen directly and be like I am going to reveal myself out of my decision I, and she's going to walk in and be like no one is going to capture me and force me I'm choosing to do this maybe Colin doesn't know that she's going to do that yeah. again we'll talk about this more in a future episode <laughs> but it's that thing of Queen doesn't really want it to stop so is the Queen going to first of all potentially ask Penelope to write things in a certain way and Penelope's going to bounce back and be like my voice is my voice regardless of what punishment you're going to think like I am not compromising my voice for anyone and you don't want me to compromise my voice because you're not interested in having a puppet you don't get the joy and entertainment out of telling another the servant to do something like you have a million servants you get the interest of the unpredictability the fun mm-hmm. and do you think that might transform into an agreement where the queen is like i'm going to commission you or i'm going to allow you to continue to write i know that it's you now maybe don't write about my family if she's pissed off about that in any way yeah. but and that's the understanding they, they reach is that i want your voice to continue being a voice in the time yeah. here's a crack theory what about if simultaneously there's like an issue of lady whistledown that's released where lady whistledown reveals that someone was trying to blackmail her her into um, mm. revealing her identity and at the same time we see Penelope going to have that meeting with the queen mm. by the end of their meeting maybe even as Penelope is strolling in the queen is like reading that issue of Lady Whistledown yes. and realizes that someone else was trying to silence or influence Lady mm. Whistledown's voice and by mm. the end of their conversation she realizes that she wants Lady Whistledown to have her own agency and be, yes. be her yeah. own person it is really interesting so the Indonesian influencer who spoke with Nick and Nick definitely like hinted we think on a question about whether the queen and pen would work together and i think lucky i think we've maybe touched on it a little bit before that i think the queen is going to hate it if she's like someone else is trying to manipulate you right and, and almost back lady whistledown in that respect is to be like i don't respect those backhand tactics of trying to blackmail someone like if anyone's gonna do it it's gonna be me and i'm not having anyone take that place you know what 
would be really interesting is if I kind of like the idea of that Lady Whistledown is- releases this issue. She walks in, the queen is reading that issue, realizes what happened. And then I wonder if it would be, it would just be really funny if the queen ends up silencing Cressida and like, you know, yes. approaches mm-hmm. Cressida somehow. <laughs> and Cressida realizes she can't, because I don't think they're going to reveal Lady Whistledown's identity to everyone. So no. it'd be really hilarious if the queen uses her power to instead silence the blackmailer. We do have those moments towards the end of the season, especially in 208, where it's like a nice like tie up with the bow where the queen does something that like publicly embraces. Mm-hmm. It's like this relationship is like endorsed by me kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And maybe that's how she does it. Because obviously mm-hmm. if the queen goes to Cressida and like you will fucking knock this off, mm-hmm. yeah. Cressida's gonna fold like a fucking chair. You know what I mean? Or or the queen yeah. walks into a ball that occurs during that time and she like publicly states that she's revoking <gasps> the bounty for Lady Whistledown yeah. because she, she's actually decided she'd rather it remain a secret and kind of implying yeah. that anybody who does reveal the secret is going to yeah. get a world of pain from her. We'll have her to answer to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she could even say, I figured it out. Yeah. She can make it such a grand thing, like, I know who Lady Whistledown's identity is. I like that too, because it makes herself seem clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which mm-hmm. is she's wanted to figure out, she's never wanted to be undermined. So she's like, I know exactly who it is and makes it like a good moment for herself. Yeah. And she's like, her identity is under my protection. Yeah. And you just see Cressida's spirits like Face sinking pale. in the yeah. corner. Yeah. <laughs> Got this gorgeous moment where Penn and Colin are together. And maybe even Cressida looks across the ballroom and she doesn't even see just Penn and Colin together but Eloise is standing with them because Mm. that rift is over which ties to 108 the last scene where we found out that it was Penelope Mm. where she said one day I may come forward but it's that thing of I may come forward but if I do it'll be my choice because we think at some point in the story at some point we're going to have that moment where everyone finds out it's Pen but Mm -hmm. where she's like one day I might but it will come from me and no one else will take that from me I love that Oh, just a quick question. Based completely on nothing but gut instinct, which episode do you think is going to be your favourite of the season? Now, 302 is cracking up to be a bloody great one. An early one for me, I think, when they're falling in love, I love a little frisson. Yeah, because that's the that's the gorgeous part about it. 100% with veg here. Yes. And the realisations that we've been wanting for so long. Yes. I'm a big tension girl. It'll probably be episodes one and two. Mm-hmm. For me, I think it's going to be three because although there is that tense moment between them in the moonlight scene, mm-hmm. I feel like their first kiss still won't be until episode three. And I <gasps> yeah, think, that's true. I think we will die. I have no proof of this, but I think that we might get that Barkley Square scene and I feel like episode three would be a really great place for it. And I feel like I'm going to just collapse in tears when I see them dancing together in public. I'd really like episode three to have this slightly sad undertone. What are we going to do if the Barkley Square scene happens? We're going to be like messaging each other. I will die. I will die. Such a romantic scene. Mm. Uh, I just know I'm going to be in tears. Mm. Like I need to send Mm. my husband away while I watch this episode. (laughs) To be honest, he has to go somewhere else while I watch the whole whole series. But (laughs) what episode are you, do you think is going to be your favorite? I do think 202 is going to be great. And and that kind of like, for fuck's sake, 302. 302. You know, 202 is one of my favorites as well. I want what's going to be the most painful episode. Like, like sad episode. I don't know. Probably six. Five? five? Maybe five or seven, I think. Five or seven. She likes the angst. Yeah. You know? I do like angst too. But there's going to be so much angst in the first episodes as well. I can't. You know what it is with the first episode that I really, I can't bear is that she's going to be, I, I really can't deal with public embarrassment. Like it makes me want to die. Yeah, no, same. Oh yeah, that's true. I'm like, has she not suffered enough? That's why three, she's not going to be failing anymore, but she and Colin are going to be falling in love. The feelings are going to be visible. Yeah. Uh, Three for me. The good stuff. Speaking of, we recently asked this by a viewer. I think one of our YouTube comments, I can't remember. What will we all be doing when the show drops? Part one and part two. And he's putting some annual leave. Yeah, we. I think I'm bucking time off. I did consult to the others. I was like, are you taking Thursday and Friday off? And I'm like, God, I, okay, for <laughs> my fellow Americans, we don't get that much vacation time. So I only took the Thursdays off because I wanted to save two extra days. We'll see how that goes goes but i took thursdays it's going to be absolute chaos because like this is the weird thing about it right is that for us as well the way that we've experienced all this there's the four of us it's been such a collective mm. experience between the four of us yeah. and what and then obviously within the wider fandom but what's so strange is when we actually watch it it's a completely individual because yeah. we're not gonna we're not gonna sit here yeah. and just watch the whole thing together like no we've said to each other we want the yeah. first time we'll watch it and we'll have our 
full experience like by ourselves yeah the way that we've watched it has been so yeah. different mm -hmm. i didn't watch the first season until the second season came out and i never i didn't binge either i watched them like very slowly over the course of a couple weeks with like a period drama watch group so actually binging the show is going to be a completely new experience for me and then beyond that i didn't even watch it until three months after the second <laughs> season came out <laughs> so. don't you fucking dare yeah. Uh, yeah we watched it late too I, I there was no urgency for me and it was the moment i finished <laughs> season two I was like oh shit and like I you know went and read the book twice joined the the Bridgerton subreddits and then very quickly the Pollen subreddit on <laughs> on reddit and basically <laughs> fell into the fandom so we all watch it very differently as well so it has to be an individual experience <laughs> but yes I think you know I'm gonna get some Prosecco, some champagne. I can't afford champagne, but I'm going to get some Prosecco. Can't get an eclair because I fucking hate eclairs. We can have champagne ops. I got given champagne for Christmas. We can open it. I'm going to go to bed for champagne. I'm going to I'm going to have my coin mug. I'm going to be sat in bed. My eyes will be blurry because it's like eight in the morning and I'm going to press play. And I don't know. I don't know. We will see, won't we? Talking of watching things and endings and beginnings and stuff like that. What do you hope for from the season three epilogue? Because, you know, we get one. <gasps> I don't even think about that. Pen's head on a stick. Perfect. Parading through town. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we haven't explored writer Colin in the series, it could be a little hint of writer Colin. Yes. Oh. I have some thoughts about this. Yeah. Which is very true to the actual book epilogue. Um, I don't want children, we know this, but for some reason it would be so cute if Colin's like writing in his little notebook and then a little baby <laughs> like climbs up and is like, oh, daddy, I'm here. <laughs> and then Bridgerton fans are like, what is with this timeline? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Daddy! <laughs> we're gonna get the whole movie, Look Who's Talking Now, in the epilogue. That's what we're gonna get for it's gonna be Bridgerton themed. Oh, God. All I've wanted from the epilogue is we're like in a room. It's like not their bedrooms, it's mm -hmm. a room. Yeah. And she's like writing in yeah. her, she's like writing her story or she's writing in a journal or she's. And he puts his hand on her shoulder. Well, yeah, so she's like lost in her little world. She's writing and everything. And then he like comes and grabs her and he like finishes the line for her. <laughs> It's a romance show, babe. No, I know. But you know how, like, something's so cute you have to throw up? Oh, right. I thought you were just, like, protesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I'm feeling. <laughs> the romance acid reflex is coming back. <laughs> And she's writing and he, and he maybe he's like, what are you writing? And Lucky will come to this in a second. But I just want him to like finish the sentence or to like kiss her or something. And then it, so like she leaves her pen down and we realise that they're on honeymoon in whatever country they want to be in. Oh yeah, it zooms out and they're on a boat. Yeah, they're on a boat, <laughs> sailing the high seas. And it's like a very, very sweet moment. Mm. And he just takes her hand and he just takes her out the room and the two of them run off together for the day. Mm. I would like to add to mine, I think a lot of us are enamoured with Colin, my wife, Bridgerton. So if he can drop a my wife in the epilogue, chef's kiss. I bet he could call her my wife or my darling, wonderful wife oh. or whatever I said earlier. If he says my wife, I'm going to need him to be like, my wife. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No, thank you. <laughs> So for me, I always imagined like a really quiet, sweet epilogue where we see like pollen in a study or in like a ship cabin on their honeymoon. And I always pictured like there's like a desk and maybe like someone is writing. Mm. And if you remember the journals that were released a couple months ago, there's like one folder or something, one page in the journal that says, this is the first chapter of a happy story. And I feel like that's the best way to have an ending, like to end with a beginning. Oh. And it just gives me pollen writer vibes and I feel like it'd also be really great mm. Lady Whistledown voiceover and just to tie into this we've had two seasons of Penelope looking out her window and basically crying so I feel like it could be really sweet if we see so you want her sobbing <laughs> no she's <not> crying, crying. <laughs> It could be really sweet if we see her at her window and she's looking out, but she smiles and we know who she's looking at because she's mm. looking at Colin. Oh. She's looking at the executioner at the Tower of London who's going to leave. Okay. okay, yes. So she turns away from her executioner who and or Colin, <laughs> but she, she turns away back to her desk. Maybe her new desk overlooks the window. Yeah. Since next season, I probably think that they need a separate residence for one of the Bridgerton couples because <laughs> it just makes sense at this point. I'm getting full house. But then I, I think this also kind of would be a good place mm -hmm. to do cutaways to some of the other characters and set up like future seasons. So like with the, this is the first chapter of a happy story that can also mm -hmm. be not just 
Pollen's ending oh. as a new beginning, but you could tease oh. Benedict, like him finding Sophie's glove if they met at a masquerade at the end of season or have him searching for her like in the book. That's the start of another story, their Cinderella story. And also from the leaks, we see Elle leaving with Fran and John, we believe. So I also thought it could be interesting if we saw maybe like a snapshot of them in the carriage on the road, already on their way to yeah. Scotland. Francesca's got the migraine tablets out because I won't shut up. Yeah. And then we finally cut back to Pollen and Colin enters the room. Mm. And I don't mm. know if Penn would be working either on a novel at that point because we not, kind of know she could become a writer or another issue of Lady Whistledown. But if it's the latter, maybe she's talking to Colin about their yeah. marriage and she's struggling with what to say about their marriage and their wedding. And Colin supplies the, yeah. the line about this is the first chapter of a happy story. And I feel like that'd be a really great yeah. turn if earlier in the season we speculated that if she's writing about the relationship, she might say, mm. refer to their engagement as curious news kind of negatively. Mm. And if she ends up in her yeah, final yeah. Lady Whistledown issue of the season talking about their marriage in a positive light mm. and talking about how this is the first chapter of a happy story ending on a positive note and they would also show some growth for her that she is writing about herself positively and believes in their love story and also that that Colin supports you know her writing as Lady yeah. Whistledown and also kind of give us some writer Colin vibes because he's giving her the inspiration for her mm. last issue of Lady Whistledown for this season so that is how I imagine the epilogue okay and then <laughs> turn on to the beautiful epilogue <laughs> All of that can happen. And then she walks up to the window. An um, executioner waves. No, a tear comes. She's smiling out the window. <laughs> yeah, there's not the shadow of an executioner. Yeah. Colin walks up, puts his hand on her shoulder, and he's crying. <laughs> he's the one crying. <laughs> there's a single tree. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> Just to finish off with a couple of quick questions before I let you guys go. What part of promo are you most looking forward to? But it can't, it's not like promos and like clips and trailers and stuff like that. What other piece of promo or information are you looking out for the most? For example, the track list, we're going to get that at some point. The soundtrack is going to come out. The title list, the episodes that gets released early. I think we're all excited for mm -hmm. a Romancing Mr. Bridgerton read through mm -hmm. where they read portions of the book. I'm excited for that. I hope that they get Nicola and Luke Newton get a Graham Norton show for like they get a little seat on the couch oh yeah that'd be so entertaining and i love him yeah that'd be so great I think that's what I'm looking forward to the most to seeing them uh, do interviews together because they have such good chemistry just as, you know, castmates. And I think it's going to be so funny. And please, God, please tell us about the letters. <laughs> if there is a God out there, if you're listening, they will hopefully talk about Paul's letters. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> and give us more insight about the season before it comes out. I'm very much looking forward to the episode titles. As soon as you said it, I was like, oh my God, because that's going to give us so much to spiral about. Yes. It's going to feed me for weeks. I, I, yeah, I love that because, yeah, we're going to get completely mm -hmm. wrong because we're going to read way too much into it. Yeah. And it'll probably be about, like, you know, some of the other characters and stuff. You know, I don't know. It's just going to be crazy. <laughs> I am most looking forward to the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. We will yeah. spiral over that. I'm oh. so excited for that. Yeah, that is going to drive us crazy. And you know what I'm going to be excited not to see? <laughs> some. <laughs> just say it. Just say it, Beans. <laughs> I'm excited not to see somewhere only we know. <laughs> So in exciting news, we're actually recruiting for a new podcast host as Beans has sadly departed this podcast and this life. Applications can be sent at Water Bar Pod. Thank you. Somewhere only we know, but not on Bridgerton. What are our predictions? for valentine's day obviously we can get the panel and stuff like that well, i think we said before two pollen clips and a non-pollen clip right yeah and i think we'll probably get the lessons one again just because it's new i think uh, yeah maybe even a bit longer i really want the return home I do like too. the Francesca debut chaos scene, the family scene. So everyone sees like, and we can see like Kate and Anthony, mm. just mm. that whole chaos because it's like connected to the story, but then it's like family focused and family chaos and it introduces Fran. Him looking to her window. Do you think we're going to get a yeah. trailer? Yeah. I don't have time to, to do that. So like, I hope not. I'm tired. I'm so <laughs> tired. I don't know. But they did one last time, right? at the Queen Charlotte. Oh, yeah. oh dear God. I feel like I'm going to say no, Maybe. just not to get my mm -hmm. hopes up, but it's definitely possible. Mm. Yeah, it's possible, perhaps not probable, but maybe it will happen. <laughs> so, dear listeners, 
Thank you for joining us for this Q&A. As you know, in a few days' time, oh my gosh, the pollen the heavens going to open again and bestow upon us many, many gifts. We will be back in the very near future to break it all down with you to react and to probably just most likely screaming to our phones. I don't know that we're going to do like a live reaction like we did the other day. No. Obviously, obviously we will have an episode for you. Maybe voice notes like we did Christmas Day. Might catch up later. Also, we don't know how long it'll take us for the episode together, but there will be an emergency episode coming. We just might need a little bit of time. So we'll keep in touch with you. We'll do our best to, <laughs> to cope with it all. But in the meantime, if you want to keep spiraling with us, where can everyone find us, Lecky? You can find us at Pod on Instagram and TikTok. And if you're listening on YouTube know that you can find us on all streaming platforms and if you're listening to us on a, <laughs> on a podcast streaming platform know that you can find us on youtube with beans's lovely collages and beans take it away this is real this is me this is prudent becoming reality thank you so much nicola Das violin do 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 do